Thank you for that introduction, David. Um, the important thing to note about the introduction he just gave is that he didn't say either of us were lawyers, because we're not. And we're gonna be talking about um, some legal aspects of border search and crossing borders. And we did that on our own interpretations and some talks with some lawyers, but we are not lawyers. Uh, second disclaimer called number one is that our thoughts and our opinions are our own and do not reflect those of our employers. So what sort of came about, um, brought about this presentation, this idea? Um, it started about a few years ago when I started to see news articles and comments about employers asking for your social media passwords or investigating your private Facebook posts in job application process prior to being employed there. And, um, and it escalated and became part of the border crossing or US visa application and extreme vetting process in 2017 that there's proposals that require your social media account access or investigations into your digital devices as, um, as you cross a border or interact with different law enforcement agencies in various contexts. So that can be really scary in the sense that when you're crossing a border that they're gonna require you to give over your devices to take a look at. But if you take a look at the numbers um, compared to the amount of visitors that come into at least the US, well, come in and go out of the US in one year, which is around just under 400 million, and the actual device searches, uh, it's really a small drop in the bucket. And I don't know if you guys can really read it, but in 2016, it was just under 20,000 uh, device searches. And in 2017, it did go up by 60%, but it's still only in the thousands, it's 30,000 device searches. So it's very, very small. But if you do happen to be one of those unlucky people that gets chosen, it's, it's really terrifying what they're doing with these devices once they take it behind in, in, a, in a closed door. Behind, you have no idea what's going on because you can't see. So one would initially think that if you don't have to give over your passcode that it's going to be fine because they're just going to look at the device if you have a passcode on it and they're not going to be able to do much. But unfortunately the CBP does require you, well they say that we're obligated to give over our passcodes uh, to these devices so that way they can take a look. And it's um, a little broad in the sense that it's just not those passcodes but just any ones that they ask for. So then the question is, what are they doing with these devices that are unlocked behind closed doors? Um, if the most benign, well, it's not really benign, but uh, what they could be doing is making backups. It's, and uh, it, specifically, if it's unlocked, making an encrypted backup. So that doesn't really sound that bad because if you don't really have a lot of information on the device, it's not really that big of a deal. But if it's an encrypted backup, there's actually a lot of sensitive information in those backups. And that can include your credentials for your social media accounts, bank accounts, really anything that you've authenticated to on the device with the applications are probably stored in a keychain of sorts. And this includes authenticated session tokens. That can translate into unmitigated uh, for forever access to your digital life, which is incredibly invasive. It goes much more so than just taking a look at what you have in your suitcase as you cross the border. But. The CBP did release in, uh, a couple of weeks ago in their newly defined directive. Uh, they released and they clarified what they were actually doing in, in the sense that they wouldn't be using these passcodes or these authenticated uh, tokens to access any data that's solely stored remotely. Which doesn't sound so bad, um, but uh, the way things do work is, uh, oh yeah, sorry, I'm skipping ahead. All right, so, and the way that they do that is they, uh, to ensure that they aren't accessing it, is they have either the user or they will disable the network access on the device before they take it into the back room. This is a little bit misleading because what that actually translates into is any type of MDM or remote wipe solution, um, if it detects any malicious access, is not going to be able to remotely wipe the device or protect the sensitive data that's on the device. Um, and it also doesn't prevent future access to this remote data if they don't delete the backups. And so the way uh, applications work is yes, even though um, they won't be able to access uh, your social media accounts or bank accounts um, if they need to, uh, to authenticate using a network, any data that's been previously downloaded with these applications is still going to be accessible to uh, law enforcement when they take a look at it. Um, so I have it on airplane mode and you can still see my private message uh, to Andy uh, in Twitter. 
But uh, as a US citizen crossing the US border, doesn't the Fourth Amendment protect me from this type of search? Um, you know, this is where we touch in, like, sorry for anybody who's not a US citizen and, or if a US citizen is not crossing a US border, this, this part doesn't apply. But the Supreme Court has actually ruled that, um, that there is an exception um, called the border search exception to uh, the warrant and probable cause requirements of the Fourth Amendment to conduct some of these searches. And this is due to the, um, they ruled that the United States has um, a, a need to protect the integrity of our borders and that need overrides some of the individual privacy rights um, we expect in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, and it's, it's not so much that um, it like overrides it, it actually redefines sort of what's considered reasonable. And a routine search or a reasonable search is anything, um, a search of anything that uh, is a common possession carried across a border, such as your luggage, um, but also your digital devices. Um, some searches are not routine, they're highly in intrusive and they um, impact the digni dignity and privacy interests of the individual. Um, but so how does this ex really apply to the digital devices that we carry with us? And so this was not defined by a government agency up until January 4th um, when the CBP, the US Customs and Border Protection Agency, released an update to their 2009 directive on searching of digital devices. And, um, and now it says that it defines what a basic search is, what an advanced search is, um, the key thing here is a basic search is without any suspicion or, um, or any reason other than they want to, they can hands on with your device, search through it, everything they can do just by interacting with it. Um, an advanced search requires individual suspicion by policy and, um, and that includes making the encrypted backup, hooking up any device to it to do the investigation. The key here is that it's a policy, it's an agency directive, it's not a law or provide legal protections and violating a, a policy doesn't give you legal recourse usually to have, um, to, to address it. There, uh, there are some court cases that sort of conflict with uh, the, what the directive claims, like the obligation to share your passcode and there, those court cases don't apply in the border search um, exception case yet but the EFF has brought some cases trying to apply them to that, but they're currently um, litigating that process. And so a big part of our talk here is providing some technical solutions and technical protections around some of this ambiguity of, well, you're, you have legal protections, there's a policy that sort of overrides some of those, where there is explicit legal justification, you have a warrant, you've been subpoenaed, they have just cause for in investigating your device, we're not up here to interfere with that. What, um, what we're here to, to provide are, uh, is a technical conversation around sort of that gray area of, of what could users do to protect themselves or what could service providers do to protect themselves. Yeah, and in that vein, we just want to help move the conversation forward. And so Congress is aware of this. They have uh, proposed in this current session a bill that would it really make our talk completely moot. Um, but as of, well, it was introduced in April and there hasn't been any movement on it since, which is unfortunate. But maybe this will help spur it forward. Yeah, the, the key parts of this is that basic searches are still basic searches. Advanced searches are still advanced searches. But advanced searches require a warrant acquired within seven days of performing the search. So you can do, still do the advanced search in the moment, but you have seven days to then get the warrant, otherwise you have to throw out any data acquired in that advanced search. So what protections are currently offered for uh, travelers when they are crossing borders? There are a few out there that are somewhat decent. Um, in our opinion, they don't go far enough, but. Uh, one of them is a uh, 1Password. For those of you who aren't familiar, 1Password is a password management solution. You store your credentials in what they term a vault, which is just, uh, it's almost like a directory of, of your credentials and you get to categorize them by vault for what they apply to. And so the idea is you create a travel vault 
that would only have the credentials for services that you need while you're traveling. And so then when you log into the 1Password site and enable travel mode, it actually deletes any other vault that's currently on your device outside of your travel vault, which is great because that, that means that you're only exposing those, but it doesn't do anything to protect uh, the keychain or any other credentials that are stored elsewhere on the device. So with Android, there's multiple users. You could configure a travel user, which again, they're only configured with the applications and services that you need while traveling. Um, but this won't do anything against a forensic solution when they plug in and take a look to see what else is there because the other users and their data is going to still show up in, in, that, um, in that pool. A gotcha here is that you know, you're logged into your travel user. If they recognize that you have multiple users, you're just as obligated to give access to that other user as you were to originally give access to your device. And so it's just more of if they notice, then you're still obligated and it's up to you to make a decision on whether you co cooperate or not. Yeah, so again, it's just a pseudo protection. Apple has an application configurator too that is uh, recommended, um, but I've never been able to actually validate this claim. But it's recommended to use this uh, because what it does, once you have your device synced with configurator two, you can designate what laptop or you know, endpoint that you're using to back up and sync your device to. And then any other uh, laptop or endpoint that you plug the device into, it will not sync with it. And so some have said that this would be a good solution against a forensic uh, device like a Celebrite. Um, but again, I can't attest to that. And Celebrite always has a ton of uh, little bypasses and gotchas. So there's no guarantee that that is actually the case. Um, so originally when we were talking about this, we were going to be building a proof of concept for laptops uh, that would enable a more extreme solution to protecting data. Uh, but upon taking a look at USB Kill, uh, which is an anti-forensic solution that if there's any changes on USB ports, it will shut down the computer. But you can also configure it to erase specific files, um, entire directories, uh, just to further protect your da data, which would be an extreme solution and was where we were headed. Uh, but since USB Kill handles it, we nixed that. Yeah, uh, we're not lawyers. We do not recommend in a border crossing you actively delete stuff in front of a border search agent before handing it over. That uh, seems like a bad idea from my non-legal opinion. Yeah, I'll probably raise a couple red flags. Um, so the best option when you're traveling is to use a burner. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, this is going to be a device that you purchase just a cheap phone, cheap laptop that you only have configured with services that you need while traveling, and ideally it's not going to be exposing anything super sensitive. Um, so th and that truly is the best option here. You wouldn't be traveling with any other of your regular content. Um, but for those of you who that's maybe not the best option or you just don't have the cash flow to do it, uh, there is the clean device uh, solution or as we like to call it, the technically proficient poor man's burner. So you can take a device and you image these devices and then you store these images in some cloud somewhere, whether it's Dropbox or whatever you choose. Um, and then you wipe the device, set it, re reset it to factory settings and install only what you need. Then when you cross the border, if they haven't taken a look at your device, you can always just reinstall those images. It's a time consuming process, but it's, it, this is highly effective and it's a way to still gain access to all the data that you would need um, on, on your day to day without having to make any types of sacrifices. But if it has been looked at, if the, they looked at the laptop or they looked at the mobile device, don't install those images because you don't know what they did. They could have installed some type of malware solution or something on there that would enable them to spy and see uh, what exactly is going on. So it would just be um, a good choice to just treat it as a burner from that point on and get a new, do new devices once you get home. Yeah, um, what Kara is talking about is if they take the device away from your presence. Um, part of the new um, directive with the CBP is that unless they have um, a reason to believe it will interfere with their search or national security concern of your presence being there for the search, you are allowed to be in the presence of the search, even the advanced search when it's conducted, although if they're going advanced search, they probably have reason to believe that you shouldn't be present for it. So while these are all great solutions, uh, they don't go far enough. None of these truly uh, protect um, you if you need to travel with your data uh, because none of them will prevent backups, well, maybe a configurator, but none of them will prevent backups of any kind of keychain or any kind of credentials. Um, so specifically when I say sensitive data, I'm, that's what I'm talking about. It's authenticated session tokens, credentials, that sort of thing. Um, so we should do better. We can do better. Um, so reiterating, 
we're not lawyers. We did some proof of concepts here that um, at least one of them may have some legal ambiguity if you actually use it in a border crossing action. We're not recommending you replicate this functionality and then do it yourselves. Um, they're more of a conversational piece to get, to get things moving forward and primarily to get the attention of service providers or OEMs to be proactive about providing some technological solutions for, for users instead of all these third parties trying to, um, to interact with the service or interact with the base OS to provide the, the answers to these situations. So the initial one that we came up with that we will not be releasing because it's a little racy um, is the dead man switch. This was uh, an application that you can install on your mobile device um, that would programmatically wipe the device if it was plugged in to, you know, the, if the port was interacted with. So it would still enable a basic search, but it would prevent any advanced search. Um, not the best solution. Uh, it would probably be better if uh, they, if, Apple or Android could create some kind of solution that you have a travel mode enabled on the device and that way the officers could still interact with the data, they could still pull the data, but they wouldn't be able to get access to the keychain or the key store, um, that they wouldn't get, be able to get access to those authenticated session tokens and, and credentials. And so yeah, that's the USB kill for the mobile situation, for the mobile device. The other solution we came up with was for the cloud storage, for your social media, for your different accounts that you have access to. And we wanted to go beyond password reset, um, so that's what we called uh, the software and nicknamed it Beeper. Um, what Beeper does is it it's a service um, listening on the internet that you can send a text message to, so you don't need to have internet access, just the ability to send a text message. You text a secret code out to it without the secret code, it ignores your, your connection. And it connects to all of your social media accounts. It changes, it generates a new password for those using Diceware and changes your password, um, takes that new password, PGPs it to a key that you've provided it with, and then stores that PGP password up on something like Dropbox or other cloud storage provider. And this way, you, um, it's never written to disk, it's all done in memory on it. And then taking a step further than that, it also revokes all accounts that, um, and devices that are associated with that, that, um, that platform. So it'll revoke your iPhone access, your laptop access. If you have browser sessions open, it'll shut those down. And it gives you plausible deniability that you cannot divulge your access to this. And in actuality, they shouldn't need this because they've said they won't do anything to access remotely stored data anyways. Well, this would be more of a solution for employers, that sort of thing. Yeah, and it's also if you've divulged your password, um, you can quickly revoke all your access instead of having to go into things um, and change it over. And we have a demo of doing just that. I am not gonna live demo this. So here we have um, your Dropbox, it was an empty Dropbox. We connect up to Twitter, um, which is the social platform that we're gonna demo. You go, you log in, we have our, our Twitter account for this. We type in our password, verifying that we, we know our password and can log in. We've also uh, associated this, um, this account with um, an iPhone. So we'll go look and you can see the iPhone listed there um, on the, the platform. Great, grand. So now I want to revoke my password. I go to send a text message. Um, I send my secret passphrase off to the account, send it, it goes, and um, Twitter will try to do a refresh and it'll see that the password's changed, Twitter behaves great, and uh, kills the session and requires me to log back in. Here I am typing in the same password. I did type it incorrectly, um, but it didn't work, so the password didn't. We now have a file here in our Dropbox, it's called twitter.pgp, go ahead and download that. Um, and then we'll run PGP to decrypt it. We have this really long Diceware passphrase there. Copy it, go back to Twitter, show that, copy and paste that in. That's much longer than the password was originally. That is the new password just by sending a text message. And then we'll go verify that the iPhone no longer has access to this as well. So this is just sort of showing like it's capable, there are solutions out there, there should be sort of some, something bad happened in my life, I need to blow a fuse and revoke access to as many things as possible right now as opposed to having to log in, 
um, and take all these precautions. There should be some solution for extreme situations. Yeah, and the main takeaway is we, we really need to do better as an industry at protecting the individual user. Um, and we need to get out in front of this instead of uh, being reactionary. We need to be more proactive in making these solutions um, to ensure that users stay safe. Yeah. So uh, it's not live yet. We're going to have a GitHub page that has all these things listed out. Um, uh, one thing I wanted to call out in particular is that um, last month the EFF presented at uh, CCC and they pre presented on this exact same topic, um, but in a much more global context, looking at UK and European and Canadian and US laws and walking through um, a lot of that. Every, basically everything up until like the technical solutions that we talked about. Well, and they don't have the updated directive. Yeah. The directive the came out the week after their talks, so their talks outdated. Thank you very much. <laughs>